Hello and welcome to the Digital Signature Podcast. Uh, this is a series of conversations with computing professionals uh, about their journeys through their careers in technology uh, and kind of a tour of a day in the life of technologists from different perspectives. Uh, my name is Bill Mongan, and uh, today on episode one, uh, I'm here with Rob Ross. Uh, and Rob served as a minister for 10 years uh, before pursuing and completing a degree in computer science at Drexel University. Uh, and uh, there he was a star researcher. We actually worked together there, um, a researcher in uh, biomedical machine learning. Um, and he's currently a machine learning engineer with Amazon Web Services and is working towards a master's degree in software engineering uh, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so Rob, thanks for being here with us today. Absolutely, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, this is, uh, this is so much fun to be doing and uh, I'm really glad we can, uh, we, can, we can sit and have this chat. So, um, so I wanna to talk today about uh, some of your experiences in, uh, in computing um, from your preparation in, in school um, and how you came to computer science and, uh, and some of the work you're doing today and, and how it kind of brings together lots of different skills across uh, computer science, because I think um, you know, people might call me a computer scientist and they might call you a computer scientist and that will have some things in common, but I think you can have two of those people in the same room and they could do totally different things and uh, that just doesn't always come across and uh, so I'm really kind of excited to hear about uh, not only your perspective, uh, we're going to dive into uh, lots of different people uh, and, and some of their experiences, but uh, really excited to get your uh, story today. Um, so first of all, uh, there's, there's kind of a lot in your job description there. There's, there's machine learning and, and software engineer and, and biomedical applications. I kind of ran through a lot of different words there. Um, could you tell us a little bit about some of that, that early work and some of your research and kind of what that, what that path uh, looked like for you? Yeah, okay. So there's, yeah, there was, uh, looking back, there was a lot of uh, fun little research, uh, one-off things that, that I did. So my freshman year, I led a group of students trying to uh, automate window washing with drones and, you know, on a, with like putting, putting a camera on a quadcopter and trying to identify where windows are in a, in a building facade. Uh, and then in my intermediary years, in my second and third year, I worked with you um, on an interdisciplinary team doing, um, doing biomedical research into sort of how do we detect uh, sick, cyclic uh, patterns that are bio-based uh, wirelessly? So more specifically, we were trying to figure out how to detect respiration rate. So how fast is someone breathing uh, without connecting a wire to them? And it turned out that was a much harder problem than we thought and involved uh, medical doctors and computer scientists and electrical engineers and fashion designers and all kinds of really like you would not expect that group of people to come together. And then my senior year, um, by a series of coincidences, I ended up leading a team that was doing uh, object detection uh, and counting on cell of cells in digitized slides of human tissue. So we linked up with a pathologist at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, that pathologist, as all pathologists are, was paid a lot of money and a significant chunk of her life, maybe 5% or something, was spent looking uh, through a microscope and saying one, two, three, four, five, 106, 107. And that's an expensive counting process. Uh, and so uh, she uh, connected with us to see if we could develop a system that could ingest that slide and, uh, and use you know, deep learning neural networks to uh, detect the, each instance of a particular kind of cell and then count them up and um, re return that as a value to her. So fairly wide ranging set of projects there. Um, what I think unifies them, and this may lead into you know, other parts of our conversation, is that the really exciting thing to talk about when you would go make a public presentation about it was not even the majority of the work. Um, the majority of the work is kind of traditional software engineering and, and computer science, thinking how to write code as part of a group, how to get um, different functions or different uh, uh, systems or even different hardware to talk to each other 
uh, that all that laying groundwork stuff turns out was a huge chunk of of all three of those projects. Uh, and I think what sometimes folks miss is that if you want to be doing good research, uh, you can't just run to the cutting edge, I don't think, but you need to really know how to do basic work first before you can do that. All right, that was a long answer. We can. <laughs> no, that that and that's exactly where I was going with that. That uh, you know, I, I there there is this um, uh, sort of dichotomy of uh, maybe multi dichotomy of, of skill sets uh, that uh, you know, if 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 someone specializes in machine learning, there there is so much that they can do. We'll talk a little bit about what machine learning is in a in a little bit. Uh, but if 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 you can't um, express those ideas, those models, that software. Uh, in a in a meaningful and user friendly and scalable and robust and secure way, uh, then you know you basically have a really cool garage project that no one else in the world can use. And uh, when you get to a scale like Amazon, I would think uh, uh, you know I think the, the 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 kind of the stakes get raised a little bit there, and that it's not enough to just have a cool you know, a model for, for looking at the world or a cool way to automate something or a cool way to, to visualize or, or make sense of, of data around us. But uh, we need a way to present that to a user and make that usable by the user and, and, and make it safe and, and robust to errors when you're at the scale of the whole world. And, uh, um, and so uh, that actually goes right into what I wanted to ask you next, which is um, what, what kinds of things are you doing at, at Amazon right now? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, I continue to work on uh, computer vision and, and mostly on object detection. Um, I work for, um, uh, so there's Amazon's a, an, an enormous place uh, and, a, and a complex place. And even if you just drill down into the, the people who are computer science-y, um, that's still a, a pretty enormous place. Um, but the team that I work on tends to fo uh, focus on, on public sector customers. So people like nonprofits or uh, universities or the US federal government or state government, those kinds of entities. Uh, and we're trying to help them understand how to do machine learning uh, and, and how the AWS ecosystem can help with that. Um, so for example, right, um, there's a whole bunch of machine learning, there's a whole bunch of problems that come along with machine learning that have to be solved. One is you've got to build a solid model that's able to take in clean data and train itself and then uh, be ready to inference on, on coming data. So like you've got to, so, so that's, and, and that's 80% of what someone with a machine learning PhD spends their time thinking about, right? They're thinking about hyperparameterization and different architectures and all kinds of big fancy words, which are incredibly important, um, but, I, but I think are maybe over-indexed on. So that's, that's one thing you need. Uh, and, and that's a hard problem. That's an exceedingly hard problem by itself. Um, but then you also need uh, a way to, to gather data, label it appropriately, uh, make sure it's clean and structured and uh, and presented to the system in an appropriate way. So, for example, you if you were teaching a system to identify birds, you wouldn't you need to have this set of information that teaches it, and then you have a different set of information that tests whether it's learned anything. And and just like with a professor on an exam, you wouldn't want to give the same problem for homework that you give on a test. Uh, unless you're trying to sort of juice your performance in your students because you're worried they're not learning it anyway. The real way to find out if they've gotten the concept is to give them a different version of the same problem that they need to work on. So that data management is also a big challenge. And then uh, if you are running inference on an interesting problem, like let's say uh, you're a clinic and you want to, and this is a year ago, and you want to make sure that everyone walking into your clinic has a face mask on right? Uh, then you maybe set up a video camera because you don't want to just hire a security person to just sit at that door. And maybe the, you know, the, each person that comes in gets a quick snapshot of them and their face is run through a system that says whether they have a mask on or not. That's a, that's a machine learning problem, right? Um, but 
let's imagine this works well. And now the, the CEO of the suite of clinics says, I have 600 clinics and I would like to install this across all of them. Uh, and I would like for, for them all. So we're gonna inference a couple hundred images a minute, right? That's a very, that's a whole other problem. How do you scale that up? Uh, and then they're going to say every month or so, maybe we're going to gather a bunch of training data and we would like to retrain the system and redeploy it again and make sure that the new system is doing better than the previous system, right? Or uh, at first, everybody was wearing like homemade kind of masks, right? And then a year into the pandemic, suddenly they have K95 masks and those look different. So maybe the model starts doing poorly. How do we main, how do we continue to observe the model and see if it's doing its work or if it's, if it's starting to fail in unexpected ways? All of those are hard problems by those, by themselves. And most organizations don't have sufficient staff to be able to do that kind of work. So what AWS does is say, listen, we're going to put really smart people on each of those problems. Mm. And then all you need to do is hook into our solutions to each of those problems to build your system. Uh, and you might be thinking at this moment, that right there sounds complicated enough. And that's exactly right. In fact, it's very hard to hook into all those systems in the right way. And so what my team does is it goes to a customer and says, tell me your problem. I'm going to help develop a proof of concept that ties together all of these well-developed subsystems into a solution that then you can go and take to production. Right. Yeah. And I, I think um, so, something you mentioned there, uh, there's two things actually you mentioned there that uh, I think are really interesting. And uh, one of them is, is something I'm going to be diving into uh, in a, a later episode, actually. Um, and it's this idea that the that if you train uh, a computer to 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 find patterns in data, like like images of people wearing masks, that if the mask changes, you know that that kind of moved the goalposts a little bit, and 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 you can't expect it right to do quite as well, and um, and that can have uh, some some really serious uh, negative ramifications. That, uh, for example, if if what it's detecting is uh, something like skin tone for for building access, or even something as simple as uh, washing your hands in an automated uh, sink, uh, we found time and time again that um, those systems work well on. Uh, white male faces or lighter skin tones, and um, and uh, and it's it's because there's a disparity in the in the way that those uh, models are trained, and uh, we're going to dig into that uh, in a in a later uh, episode and uh, talk about some of the things that are being done to address that, and and some of the things that really ought to be done uh, to address that, uh, and um, uh, and the other thing that uh, that you you mentioned is um, the, these different types of problems that are inherent in solving one thing. It, we're, we're, we're seeing a kind of a world where problems are bigger than ourselves. Uh, you, you can't solve it all by yourself and you need other people with different diverse uh, uh, expertise. Um, and really you need different platforms to help you do that. And it, it sounds like that's, that's kind of where Amazon's uh, AWS suite comes into play that it's it's got these components oh you need a a data management system here you know and you can you can sort of build these uh, these building blocks together um, I think a message for uh, if if you're a, a a student in school today or you're a parent uh, or a teacher of a student uh, in in school um, a lot of times if you, if you're lucky what what you call computer science is the computer science class it's it's kind of a big umbrella course that you know kind of does everything and that's that's which is totally understandable um, and uh, and chances are you'll learn some common skills like like programming and and some problem solving but uh, but really what I'm hearing is this um, this sort of teasing out of how to ask good questions and how to bring in people that can solve different parts of your problems so that you don't have to bite off everything yourself um, and maybe that ought to be a little reassuring that you don't have to be an expert in the entire field of computing to have a career in computer science because there's an entire industry around uh, creating those tools to to, to support um, and bring in those those expertises both technologically but um, also really from a from a, a people point of view that that we can specialize uh, just like scientists do uh, in, in science we know that there's 
physics and chemistry and biology. And there's, there's these, you know, there's, there's overlaps between those, but uh, you don't really expect the chemist to be a, a geology expert. Uh, and um, I think in the same way, it's, it's okay if the, you know, the machine learning person has the support of the programmers and the software engineers that know how to scale and know how to use these tools. And um, you can, you can kind of specialize a little bit depending on, uh, depending on what your, what your interests are. Um, and, um, well, I don't know. What do you, what do you what do you think of that? Do you do you agree with that? So I think that's right. I think that's completely right. I think there's a risk that people might hear it wrongly. Mm -hmm. And so here's what I would say: sort of in the same way that um, you go to a foot doctor and say my head hurts, and the foot doctor says, "Okay, I'm going to need to send you to a different doctor because I that's not my body part." I don't know how to fix that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, you could go to a machine learning person and say, uh, how do I write uh, a web application to crowdsource annotating my data set? And the machine learning person is probably going to say, I have no idea. That's not my body part. You're going to have to go talk to a different computer scientist. Um, that's all true. Um, what I think sometimes um, people might misunderstand is to think, oh, well, then I can just sort of outsource all of it. Mm -hmm. And maybe I can be a, a computer scientist without a lot of work. I can just be the person who like connects people up. Uh, and, and that I think is where it's wrong. I think there's, a, and I think there are people who, you know, it's, it's very attractive to say, if you use my system, uh, all you need is a couple lines of code and you can develop this really cool thing. And you don't need to really understand it all that much. I remember a conversation with my wife. So I went back to school when I was 35 uh, with kids who were one, three, and five years old. Uh, and my wife was home watching them. And I went back to school for four years full time, um, 40, 50 hours a week mm -hmm. to be retrained as a computer scientist, graduated when I was 39. And as we were, as my wife and I were considering this decision, uh, I had pretty strong feelings that this was the thing I needed to do. And she said, you know, I hear on the radio and I see advertised on the internet, these like 12 week boot camps. And it's really hard for me to understand why you think you need like 208 weeks mm -hmm. to learn computer science when this guy over here says he can teach you what you need to know in 12. Uh, and what I found was, I studied almost as hard as I could for 208 weeks and feel like I just sort of kept a hold of this, this thing. Uh, and part of that is, you know, everything's connected to everything else. And anytime you drill down into a discipline, there's jargon that develops. Like I remember sitting in a CS 101 class and someone said, um, this function returns a string. And I realized I didn't know what return meant and I didn't know what string meant. And I looked through the book and it wasn't defined anywhere because like that was like that was so basic uh, to the author that it was uh, it didn't it didn't need to be defined. It was a, you know, a waste of text on the page. And I can understand that. So it's it's hard to just kind of get into it. But I so so what I would say is you don't need to know it all. It's physically impossible to know it all. You'll do well to know, you know, people talk about sort of like T-shaped expertise, right? Where you like go deep in one area and then you're shallow in maybe five or six areas uh, so that you can at least talk to the other people um, on your team. And that's, but, but I would say, yeah, it's, it's definitely a T-shape and it's not just like a flat horizon. Right. Yeah. And, and that, that goes to a whole interesting other conversation that, uh, uh, that that is probably for another day, but th this idea of you know what is the role of those types of um, of resources, uh, those skill building uh, kinds of resources, which um, you know very well could have a place there, and and it it seems to me that they would be in kind of developing that that shallow end of the T, the the top of the T, um, and uh, which can do uh, you know some things very well, uh, and uh, and uh, and and be kind of a generalist and be able to collaborate, but. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, maybe unlike uh, other fields, um, it's, it's, it's computing gives you kind of an opportunity to pick that 
that spot where you want to drill down that 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 vertical depth of the T and uh, and see what you want to specialize in. And most fields do that, but uh, but uh, in in computing, it's uh, almost everyone does, and it's almost always different uh, from one person to the next. Exactly where they decided to make that that drill and uh, the kinds of things they wanted to explore. It's actually the reason I decided to call this uh, podcast. Um, the digital signature podcast, and uh, Rob knows what a digital signature is, but uh, but I'm gonna I'll tell everybody uh, that uh, it's um, uh, it uses cryptography and it it creates a uh, a file uh, that uh, you can use to prove your identity. It's uh, almost like having an ID card or a driver's license, something that's unique to you. Um, and uh, in a way, I, I, I kind of see all these career pathways and the type of uh, uh, professional development and, and, and just that preparation journey that each of us goes through. I think it's really unique. Uh, and I think we all have kind of our, our little fingerprint there uh, in the way that we went about, um, you know, training up and preparing and, and getting used to uh, and experiencing technology. And, uh, and so I called this the digital signature because I think what we're going to find is that every one of these conversations is going to look very different. And, um, you know, there, there, there could be, uh, you know, one perspective on one day and a totally different but still equally valid perspective on another day because it approaches the field from a, a different place. So I think um, I, I think you've kind of touched on that. And I think I think that's to me, that's one of the things that makes the field uh, so exciting. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think that's right. And also your your specialty will change over a career, right? So you may, so, so I came out, I just happened to do a machine learning project my senior year, and that was enough to get me hired at a, a machine learning lab and then ultimately hired to Amazon. Uh, when I got to Amazon, I was asked to help be the person who delivers these solutions so so you know packages them up in a, into a docker container and and make sure that the the um, system we're delivering is the system that we trained you know those that's not um, immediately the case uh, and and i didn't know anything about docker when i started and now you know i am sort of the subject matter expert on docker for my little team uh, and so those that also will happen where you will you will continue to learn. I mean, I, you know, some of the some of the better machine learning experts I talk to have been working professionals for 20 years. Now, what does that mean? Right? AlexNet came out in 2012. That was 10 years ago. So that means some of the best machine learning experts I know have never had a class on machine learning. Now, that doesn't mean that they have not been learning like crazy you know, and reading papers and, and implementing and studying documentation and that sort of thing. But, but you will, I think in computer science, may, maybe more than any other field, um, continue to grow uh, and in your knowledge and experience as you move through your career. Yeah, I, I, um, I, that, is, that is a really good point. And um, the, 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 the types of uh, 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 tools and techniques and uh, sub areas, I think that you get involved with, um, yeah, may not have existed uh, when you were a student. And, you know, that's scary, but I think that's also really encouraging that, um, you know, what, what we call a machine learning person today uh, is, is probably the, the, the person that we called a, a statistician. Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Um, and, and, uh, and, and we realized that we could use statistical principles to, uh, to make inferences about the world around us. I mean, that's what statistics does. And uh, if we can scale that and automate that, uh, well, maybe we could, we could give that a name. And so and not to say that machine learning is entirely statistics, but, um, but there's a lot of overlap there. And the, the kinds of training that, that those folks brought to the table, um, you know, probably did come from classes that you could actually take, um, even though that field didn't exist. So it, it's, it's, I think it's kind of encouraging to hear that those fields didn't just pop up around you. And now all of a sudden you're behind the game, you know, you, you've already missed out. And uh, um, I think it's really evolving with us. And, uh, and it's, it's bringing together those different people and different uh, backgrounds and different expertises and, and saying, hey, if we have this person in the room and this person in the room and this person in the room, we could do really cool things together, bringing the stuff that we bring to the table. And uh, um, I, I think that to me has been one of the most inspiring things about computing is that 
um, there's really nothing you can't do uh, because you can always uh, find the right person to fill in uh, the gaps that uh, that you have. And uh, um, so I think I think that's uh, that's 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 well said. Um, so uh, so Rob, I'm going to finish with a, a, a kind of a personal question. Um, so uh, so I think your kind of academic journey, what what's I talked about what what makes these uh, these these pathways kind of unique. And um, I think one of the things that makes your journey very unique is that um, you initially studied in the humanities uh, and you have a, a graduate degree. Uh, I think it's a master's in, in divinity. Um, I mentioned in the beginning you were a uh, you were you were a pastor, you were a minister, um, and uh, and 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 then kind of kind of made this pivot towards uh, math and science and technology. And I, so I was curious, like what uh, what what triggered that interest, um, and has that background kind of changed or shaped the way that you view uh, technology and STEM, and vice versa? Have the have the two kind of uh, interrelated uh, in any way for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um... So I think I misunderstood what computer science was mm -hmm. until I was about 32 or 33. Uh, I, I thought that computer science was writing video games mm -hmm. or um, plugging wires into boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are both uh, jobs that you can get in computing, but I thought that was all of computing. And I knew that neither of those things were very interesting to me. And so I didn't wanna do computers. Uh, now, it turns out that the things that I find interesting, which is thinking very precisely and logically and breaking a complex fuzzy problems uh, down into uh, simpler, clearer problems that can then be solved on a small level and then strung together. Uh, and describing that solution with an arbitrary level of precision, uh, turns out those are very, very important aspects of being a computer scientist, right? Uh, and and I just, it just, I just didn't know that. Um, I think it's so often the case that when someone says that they want to be a lawyer, right, what they really mean is that they have seen someone on television playing a lawyer and they want to be that person or do that, have that person's life. Or if they want to be a doctor, it's because they've watched Grey's Anatomy, right, or some other show like that. Um, and, and so if you don't know people in the field, it's really hard to know what the field's about and what the, a day in the life of, of someone who's in the field is like. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the things that, that I am most excited about this uh, project is, is, you know, getting a sense of, or, or being able to describe to people who maybe don't know any, any computer scientists what their life is like. Um, so that was, I think, a big piece for me. It was, it was less, uh, it was less having a change of heart than it was having a change of like understanding of mm. what what the field meant. Uh, and also a, it was a chance, I had a chance when I was on paternity leave, this is sort of what sparked, sparked this change for me, to just think about what kind of things I naturally enjoy. And I found myself going back to the math and logic puzzles of my childhood. You know, I really enjoyed math and, and science and sort of um, logic games, like the kind you might see on the SAT or GRE, those sorts of things. But I didn't know anyone intimately who used those skills in their life. Uh, and so I didn't think that you yeah. could have a job where those skills would get used. Uh, and it took a while to figure out that you can. Mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad you said that. I, 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 uh, you know, Rob, Rob and I have known each other for a long time, and I almost felt like I was cheating by by asking that. And yet, you said some things that I, I wasn't expecting. Uh, um, you know, one of them is that that perception of what computer science uh, is, and it's exactly why uh, I want to run this this series. Is that 
Um, so often, uh, you know, when, when if, if kids are in school, uh, the school's lucky to have a computer class and a computer teacher at all. And, uh, um, and if they do, it's, it's just one and, and the teacher might be all by themselves and, uh, and the student uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, other people they can talk to in a lot of places where they can get uh, some of those perspectives. And um, so I, I wanted to sort of create a, almost a, like a curation of uh, these little stories and vignettes and, and examples and activities that just kind of showcase all the different uh, pieces of, of computing so that folks can have an understanding of, of, of just what it is. Uh, it's, it's, it's really broad. It's one name for a whole lot of things. And uh, that, that's, a, that's, I think, a good thing because there's so many ways to get involved. But uh, if, if you're not aware of that, then, then you'll never come. And, and I, I, I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's a missed opportunity. Um, and by the same token, uh, you know, you mentioned there is science in computer science. We, we do experiments, we ask questions, and we collect data to try to answer those questions. Um, we just happen to use tools that can help us do those things really, really fast and, uh, and in an automated way. Uh, uh, but really, at the end of the day, a lot of times what we're doing is uh, asking questions about the world around us, and then we use software and hardware to, to try to answer them at a scale that's bigger than what we could have done with uh, a pen and paper. And, uh, and that then feeds back to all these other disciplines, to the sciences and the humanities and uh, music and, and uh, art uh, and production and, and basically anything you can think of. Um, if, you're, if you're asking good questions, um, you can take this stuff, this technology, and, and really apply it to anything you want. I think that's that's really exciting. If only we did a better job of messaging about what those things are, what those things look like, and uh, so that's that's exactly what this is all about. And uh, I'm I'm really glad that uh, uh, that that you were the one to have kicked this off because that's that's exactly the message and it, it's exactly the theme. I'm I'm really glad you said it. Uh, and uh, so so thanks for for doing this, Rob. I, I really appreciate this. Um, and uh, I know we're going to talk some more, and uh, maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll, we'll we'll hit the record button and put them up here too. Um, but uh, uh, but we'll leave it there for now. Uh, so uh, so thanks again, uh, Rob, and uh, and thank you for for tuning in with us today. Uh, so a couple of things for for more information about this series, uh, you can um, uh, also see some activities, uh, a toolkit, uh, things you can try at home to kind of see what a day in the life of someone like Rob actually looks like, and get a little more perspective on that. Um, we've got a website. Uh, it's uh, digitalsignature.fm. Uh, and uh, there's a comments uh, section there. There's even a page to submit some, um, some suggestions, ideas, things you'd like to hear more about. Uh, so if, if you don't have someone uh, at your school or a colleague that you can be asking these things of, um, consider me that person and uh, you can reach out to me that way. Uh, you can also uh, get in touch with me by email uh, at uh, bill at uh, digitalsignature.fm. Uh, so don't be a stranger. Uh, this is meant to be uh, really engaging and interactive, and it's, it's there to, to get you uh, more information and, and stories from, from folks who are living it uh, every day, just like uh, Rob and me. So um, Rob, thanks so much again, uh, and uh, we'll see you all next time. Uh, take care. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Bill. Thanks, everyone.